History is full of horrific but frequently overlooked moments, take Vlad the Impaler, a real-life medieval ruler whose dark reputation inspired Bram Stoker's Dracula. He did not suck blood. He impaled people instead by the thousands. Vlad was so scary that he once frightened an army of invaders into retreat, when he lined the road ahead of them with tens of thousands of impaled victims. Following are 20 things about those and other lesser-known horrific facts from history. Vlad the Impaler lived up to his horrific nickname. Vlad III was a medieval ruler of Wallachia, a region of what is now southern Romania, better known to history as Vlad Dracula or Vlad the Impaler. His methods of governance and warfare terrified his contemporaries, and still send shivers down spines to the present day. His nickname Dracula which means son of Dracula is from the Latin Draco, or dragon after his father was inducted into the Order of the Dragon, created by Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund to rally Christians against the Ottoman Turks. He was the real-life inspiration for Bram Stoker's fictional vampire, his other sobriquet, the impaler he got from his preferred method of punishment. The real-life Dracula did not suck people's blood. Instead he shoved sharpened stakes up their butts. Vlad III was born circa 1430 in Transylvania, the son of Vlad II an aristocrat who lived in exile the father took over the throne of Wallachia in 1436, but was kicked out a few years later by rivals. So he switched sides and allied with the Ottoman Sultan, who restored him to power. As proof of loyalty he sent two sons, Vlad III and his brother Radu, to the Sultan's court as hostages. Radu eventually converted to Islam, but Vlad disliked the Ottomans and resented his father for his betrayal of the Order of the Dragon, into which Vlad himself had been inducted when he was five years old. The real Dracula did not suck people's blood, he shoved sharp poles up their rears. Vlad the Impaler's father was overthrown once again in 1447, and this time his enemies killed him while they were at the Ottomans marched in and installed Vlad on Wallachia's throne, but his rule lasted only a few months before he too was overthrown. He regained the throne in 1456, this time with help from the Ottomans' enemies, the Hungarians. To celebrate he invited 200 aristocrats and their families to an Easter Sunday feast in 1457. At some point, he asked his guests how old they were. He wanted to know who had been old enough to have participated in his father's overthrow back in 1447. He then dragged those who fit the bill outside, and had them promptly impaled a horrific way to die, Victims had large, sharpened, wooden stakes driven through their bodies, often through their rear end. The stake was then planted vertically into the ground, so that the victim was left to dangle in the air. Vlad impaled people in a manner that avoided damage to vital organs, and thus averted immediate death. Instead, the victims suffered hours or even days of agony before they expired. To add an artistic touch to the horror, Vlad impaled aristocrats arranged in rows that came to be known as the Forest of the Impaled. Vlad the Impaler used a forest of impaled victims to scare away Ottoman invaders. The mass impalements did not halt Vlad the Impaler's Easter Sunday feast, and the party went on. Afterwards, the wives and children of the impaled aristocrats were taken to the mountains to rebuild a fortress, still dressed in their Easter finery. He worked them hard, until most of them died of exhaustion. Months later when the job was finally done, Vlad's reward for the few survivors, now skeletal figures clad in tattered rags was to impale them. That was just the start of the Impaler's passion for impalement. To solidify his rule, Vlad systematically exterminated the aristocratic class that had given his family so much trouble. Impalement was his preferred method to deal with them, and anybody else who angered him. He also went to war against the Ottomans. Sultan Mehmed II the Conqueror, who had seized Constantinople and extinguished the Byzantine Empire a few years earlier, sent a force of 10,000 cavalrymen to deal with him. Vlad ambushed and defeated them, then impaled the survivors, with their leader mounted on the highest stake. In 1462 the Sultan led an army of 90,000 against the Impaler. As they approached Vlad's capital, the Ottomans met no resistance. Instead, the road was lined with 20,000 impaled Turks and Muslim Bulgarians. The horrific sight was enough to spook the Sultan, who promptly turned around and went back home. The Ancient Chinese Ruler Who Became History's First Serial Killer Lu Pengli, a 2nd century BC prince of ancient China, was a member of the Han dynasty's imperial family. He was also the first serial killer in recorded history. In 144 BC, Emperor Jing, Lu Pengli's cousin, appointed him to rule the city of Zhidong and its countryside. 
that turned out to be unfortunate for the good people of Zhedong, who were governed by Pengli for the next 23 years? Among other things, Pengli liked to murder his subjects for the sheer fun of it. The psychotic prince probably would have liked Ramsay Bolton from HBO's Game of Thrones, because like that fictional character, Lu Pengli liked to hunt human beings for sport, a minimum of 100 people, were killed by him for his amusement, and odds are that the true number of his victims was much higher. As seen below, his reign of psychotic terror lasted for over two decades, in which his subjects were too scared to come out of their homes at night. The Horrific Deeds of Lu Pengli Lu Pengli's decades-long reign of terror finally ended, when one of his victims finally screwed up the courage to travel to the imperial capital, where he complained to the emperor, because justice was illusory throughout most of history. Pengli got off light, he was not executed, but was simply stripped of his rank and banished. As described by Han historian Shima Qian, Lu Pengli was arrogant and cruel, and paid no attention to the etiquette demanded between ruler and subject. In the evenings he used to go out on marauding expeditions with 20 or 30 slaves or young men who were in hiding from the law, murdering people and seizing their belongings for sheer sport. When the affair came to light it was found he had murdered at least 100 or more persons. Everyone in the kingdom knew about his ways, so that the people were afraid to venture out of their houses at night. The son of one of his victims finally sent a report to the Han emperor, and the Han officials requested that he be executed. The emperor could not bear to carry out their recommendation but made him a commoner and banished him to Shangyang. A Horrific Caribbean Disaster At the turn of the 20th century, the beautiful city of Saint-Pierre was the largest settlement in the French colony of Martinique, and in many ways it outshone the island's capital city. Fort de France Saint-Pierre was the colony's economic center, with a busy harbor that bustled with ships as they offloaded imports, and carried off the island's exports of rum and sugar to the rest of the world. St. Pierre was also Martinique's cultural center, known as the Paris of the Caribbean. However, the city had a major drawback, it was nestled beneath a massive volcano, Mount Pili. On April 23, 1902, people began to hear the sounds of a series of relatively small, but still alarming explosive pops that came from the mountaintop. Over the next two weeks, the volume and vigor of the explosions increased steadily, until they became greater than anything ever heard since Europeans first arrived in Martinique. Then on the morning of May 8, 1902, the top of Mount Pili blew up in a massive eruption. As seen below the results were horrific. A prosperous town that vanished beneath an incandescent volcanic cloud. A column of dense smoke shot skywards from the top of Mount Pili, and formed a mushroom cloud that darkened the sky for about 50 miles. Another dense cloud of glowing black smoke shot horizontally, straight into St. Pierre. The cloud consisted of superheated steam, gases, ashes, and dust known as tephra, and it raced into the city at a speed of nearly 420 miles per hour. All the town's buildings were flattened, and the population was burned or suffocated to death. Offshore, a witness in a steamship described the city's horrific fate when the incandescent cloud hit, the fire rolled down upon St. Pierre, the town vanished before our eyes. The eruption killed about 28,000 people in St. Pierre, the town's entire population except for one man, Luger Silbaris. A manual laborer and frequent troublemaker, Silbaris had gotten into a bar brawl on the night of May 7, just a few hours before the eruption. As seen below his wayward ways saved Silbaris' life. Being a jerk saved this man's life. After a drunken brawl Luger Silbaris was tossed into jail overnight for assault, and held in solitary confinement, that was in a partially underground magazine with stone walls, which doubled as a cell. It had no windows, and its only ventilation was through tiny gratings on a door that faced away from the volcano. In short, Silbari's solitary confinement cell was the most sheltered place in St. Pierre on the morning of May 8, 1902, that saved his life. When Mount Pili erupted, it grew very dark in Silbari's cell. A short while later, hot air and fine ash began to enter his cell through the door's gratings. To stop it he wetted his clothes with urine and used them to stuff the openings. That helped a little, but still it got hot enough to cause deep burns on much of his body. Four days after the horrific eruption, rescuers heard Silbari's cries amidst the rubble of the prison, his miraculous survival garnered worldwide attention, and he got signed on by Barnum and Bailey to tour with its circus. His cell exists to this day, preserved in the rebuilt St. Pierre. He was lucky, but many more were not.
about 30,000 people were killed in the city and its vicinity, in what turned out to be the 20th century's deadliest volcanic eruption. The Brutal German Regime in Southwest Africa In the 1880s, Imperial Germany established a colony in Southwest Africa, today's Namibia, the region was home to African pastoralists, such as the Nama people, who numbered about 20,000, and the Herero, a tribal group of about 75,000 cattle herders. The German colonists ruled with a heavy hand, and horrific brutality that stood out even amidst the brutal norms of European colonization. A German commander in charge of the region's conquest stated it in 1888, only uncompromising brutality will lead to victory. The African natives' livestock and best lands were confiscated and given to German settlers, and the Africans themselves were frequently seized and used as slave labor, racial discrimination was rife, and most German settlers viewed the natives as a source of cheap labor, while others simply called for their extermination. The Africans' resentment was further exacerbated by the frequent rape of native women and girls by settlers, a crime that the German authorities rarely addressed, let alone punished. The Holocaust was not the first time that Germans set out to exterminate an entire people. Unsurprisingly, the German colonists' abuses alienated the natives of Southwest Africa, when the Herero and Nama learned that the Germans planned to further divide their lands and herd them into reservations, they rose up in rebellion. In January 1904, they launched a surprise attack that killed about 125 Germans. In response, the Germans sent an expeditionary force of about 14,000 soldiers, led by a General Lothar von Trotha. He stated his intent to end the rebellion with a horrific expedient, the extermination of the Herero. As he put it, I believe that the nation as such should be annihilated, or if this was not possible by tactical measures, have to be expelled from the country. In August 1904, Trotha's men defeated about 3,000 Herero combatants. As a guide employed by the Germans described what happened next, after the battle all men, women and children who fell into German hands, wounded or otherwise, were mercilessly put to death. Then the Germans set off in pursuit of the rest, and all those found by the wayside and in the sandveld were shot down and bayoneted to death. The mass of the Herero men were unarmed and thus unable to offer resistance. The Horrific Herero and Nama Genocide Led by General Lothar von Trotha, the German soldiers pursued the Herero survivors into the desert. To prevent them from accessing water, they placed armed guards on water sources, or poisoned the wells. As a result, thousands died from thirst. On October 4, 1904, Trotha reported to his superiors, I believe that this Herero nation, as a nation must be exterminated, I prefer for the nation to disappear entirely rather than allow them to infect our troops with their diseases. As to the Nama, the German settlers called for their extermination, those who did not flee were sent to concentration camps, and a third of the captives died en route before they reached the camps. Once in the camps, many more died of epidemics and mistreatment. The captives were subjected to forced labor, beaten, whipped, and tortured, while many of the women were raped or made into concubines. In total about 65,000 Herero, 80% of their total population, perished in the horrific genocide. 10,000 Nama, 50% of that people were also killed. The frightful legacy of this grandson of Genghis Khan is remembered in the Middle East to this day. Talaku 1217 to 1265 was a grandson of the great Mongol conqueror Genghis Khan and a younger brother of the Grand Khan's monk and Kublai. He expanded the Mongol domain into Western Asia with a horrific savagery that remains in the region's memory to this day. Among other things, he destroyed Baghdad and extinguished the Abbasid Caliphate, conquered Syria, and menaced Egypt and the Crusader states. While at it, he also destroyed the culture of medieval Persian and founded the Ilkhanate in Persia a precursor of modern Iran. Genghis Khan had invaded the Islamic Crimean Empire of Central Asia in 1220, and within two years, crushed and conquered it in a campaign that brought the Mongols to eastern Persia, the Muslim world of Western Asia then caught a break for about three decades, as the Mongols refocused their energies against China, the Rus principalities and Eastern Europe. That reprieve came to an end in 1251, was Halaku was recognized by his brother the Grand Khan Monk as ruler of the Ilkhanate in Persia, and was ordered to extend Mongol power into the Islamic world. A horrific cult that was extinguished by an even more horrific conqueror. As a preliminary, Halaku attacked and seized the mountain fortresses of the Order of Assassins, a militant Islamic cult led by a series of mystics, 
each known as the old man of the mountain, the assassins recruited and brainwashed young men, with flimflam that convinced them that their leader controlled the keys to paradise. They got recruits high on hashish, and set them loose in beautiful gardens full of gorgeous women. When they came down from the high and woke up, they were back in regular and austere surroundings. The recruits were told that they had been and been in paradise, and that the only way to return was to die while killing for the old man of the mountain. It proved highly effective. The order of assassins, with no shortage of randy young men high on hash and desperate to get back to paradise, terrorized the Middle East for generations. The assassins' horrific depredations ended when the even more horrific Halaku showed up with a Mongol army, overran their mountain fortresses, captured their leader, and sent him back to Mongolia where he was executed. Halaku wreaked havoc throughout the Middle East. After he destroyed the assassins, Halaku turned to the Abbasid Caliphate. When the Caliph refused to submit, he was attacked and besieged in Baghdad. Halaku's army captured the city in 1258, and in a horrific sack, destroyed it along with all of its treasures, such as the Grand Library of Baghdad. Between 200,000 to a million inhabitants were massacred. A Mongol taboo prohibited spilling royal blood. To get around it the captured caliph was rolled into a carpet, which was then trampled by Mongols' horses as they rode out of Baghdad. That ended the Abbasids and the Islamic institution of the caliphate. Halaku then conquered Syria and ended the Ayyubid dynasty founded by Saladin. He then set his eyes on Egypt, but on the eve of invasion he received word that his brother Monk had died. As a potential successor, Halaku returned to Mongolia. In his absence, the Mongols he left behind under a trusted subordinate were wiped out by the Egyptian Mamluks at the Battle of Ain Jalad in 1260, the first major defeat of a Mongol army, and one that broke the spell of Mongol invincibility. Halaku was not selected to succeed his brother as Great Khan, so he returned to avenge the defeat at Ain Jalat. Instead, he ended up in a Mongol civil war with a cousin, Burke, leader of the Mongol Golden Horde that dominated the Russian steppe and Eastern Europe. Burke had converted to Islam and was enraged by Halaku's rampage in the Muslim world. The war with Burke was Halaku's main focus for the remainder of his life until his death in 1265. The Middle Ages' Scariest Outlaw Medieval German bandit Peter Nyers, died 1581, was a black arts practitioner, and one of history's most prolific serial killers. He began his criminal career as a highwayman in Alsace, present-day France, and eventually headed a gang of about 24 bandits. He also became a key figure in a loose network of bandit and highwayman gangs that joined forces on occasion to conduct major operations that required large numbers of men. His criminal activity spanned a large territory that included western France, the Rhineland and Bavaria in southern Germany. He was no run-of-the-mill outlaw, however. What set Nyers apart from other bandits was his bloodthirstiness and gratuitous cruelty. He was not content to simply rob or kill his victims. He liked to torture those who fell into his hands and slew them in a variety of fiendishly inventive ways. As he confessed after his arrest, he murdered 544 people over a 15-year period and cut the fetuses out of the wombs of 24 pregnant women. The fetuses were used as ingredients in his black magic, and he consumed them in horrific cannibalistic acts. He was captured in 1577 and under torture, confessed to 75 murders in the previous 11 years. However, he escaped before he could be executed and went on to commit many more depravities. This horrific killer met a suitably horrific end. After his escape, Peter Nyers resumed his criminal activities, with even greater cruelty and bloodthirstiness. Indeed the majority of his horrific murders and depravities occurred in the four years after his escape. Whereas he had murdered 75 people in the 11 years before his arrest in 1577, he would murder an estimated 569 more people in the four years from 1577 to 1581, when he was arrested for a second and final time. He was taken to the Bavarian city of Neumarkt in der Oberpfalz for a public execution, in which the authorities went medieval on Nyers, literally and figuratively. Even for an era in which horrific torture and gruesome executions were routine, Peter Nyer's execution, which commenced on September 16, 1581, stood out as a particularly horrific affair. It was a three-day ordeal and on the first of them, the authorities flayed Nyer's skin, then poured hot oil on his exposed muscles to slough off layers of his flesh. On the second day, his feet were coated in grease, and his lower body was slowly grilled over a low fire. On the third day, 
his body was broken on the wheel, with dozens of blows that smashed his major bones to pieces. Finally the executioners quartered him while still alive, then sawed his body into pieces. The fickle prince from Braveheart died a horrific death. King Edward II of England, 1284 to 1327, the fickle prince from Braveheart, was the son and successor of Edward I, one of England's greatest monarchs, and the movie's batty king. Edward II was a disappointment to both his father while the latter lived, and to his subjects after he ascended the throne in 1307. A weak and flighty monarch, Edward II relied on and elevated favorites who misgoverned the realm in his name. To compound the problem, he did little to counter the perception that those favorites were his gay lovers. Poor government and perceived effeteness in a homophobic age earned Edward the widespread hatred and contempt of his subjects, and brought him to a horrific end. Early in his reign, Edward II angered his barons when he elevated to an earldom a frivolous favorite and rumored lover, Piers Gaveston. The barons demanded that Edward banish Gaveston, and assent to a document that limited the king's power over appointments and finances. Edward caved in and banished Gaveston, but allowed him to return a short while later. In response, the exasperated barons seized and executed Gaveston. This king humiliated his queen, so she deposed him. In 1314 Edward II led an army into Scotland, but he was decisively defeated at the Battle of Bannockburn, at a stroke he lost all the gains his father had made with years of toil, and great expense to assert English control of Scotland. Humiliated, Edward was unable to resist his magnates, when they formed a baronial committee that sidelined him, and ruled the realm. It lasted until Edward found another favorite, yet another rumored lover, Hugh de Spencer and elevated him. As with the king's earlier favorite, the barons demanded that Edward banish de Spencer. This time however he fought back. With the de Spencer family's support, Edward defeated the barons and regained his authority in 1322, however his public displays of affection for Hugh de Spencer humiliated and alienated Edward's queen Isabella. While on a diplomatic mission to Paris in 1325, she became the mistress of Roger Mortimer, an exiled baronial opponent of Edward. In 1326 the couple invaded England, executed the dispensers, deposed Edward II and replaced him with his 14-year-old son, who was crowned Edward III in January 1327. Roger Mortimer was made regent to govern England, until the new monarch came of age. Edward II's killers chose a particularly horrific way to do him in. Roger Mortimer heard of plots to rescue the deposed Edward II, so he had him moved in April 1327, to Berkeley Castle in Gloucestershire a more secure location. Reports of fresh plots to free Edward caused Mortimer to order him moved to various locations in the spring and summer of 1327, before he was finally returned to Berkeley Castle. The continued political instability, and the uncertainty whether one of those plots might finally succeed, determined Mortimer to end the problem once and for all, and put Edward II beyond rescue via murder. Edward's killers did not want to leave visible marks of foul play on the body, contemptuous of his perceived effeminacy and homosexuality, they chose a particularly horrific means to do him in on the night of September 21, 1327. The deposed monarch was held down, and a red-hot poker was shoved up his rectum to burn his bowels from the inside. Another version has it that a tube was first inserted in his rectum, and a red-hot metal bolt was then dropped down the tube into his bowels. Either way, his screams were said to have reverberated around the castle, and were heard far beyond its walls. Before Al-Qaeda or ISIS, there were these horrific extremists. Long before the horrific depredations of Al-Qaeda and ISIS there were the even more horrific Qarij, whose name means outsiders in Arabic, Centuries before Osama bin Laden was in diapers, the Qarij were a radical fundamentalist faction of early Islamic dissenters, who appeared on the scene after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. They came up with the concept of tikfir, whereby Muslims who disagreed with them were deemed apostates and kafirs, infidels. That gave them license to get around the Islamic prohibition against killing fellow Muslims. As such, the Qarij established the philosophical foundations for modern terrorists such as the Taliban, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, they emerged when a succession dispute erupted between those who believed that leadership after Muhammad's demise should be confined to Muhammad's family and bloodline, and those who thought it should be open to whomever the Muslim community chose. The former, a minority, coalesced around Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law Ali ibn Abi Talib, 
and became known as the Shiites or faction of Ali. The latter the majority became known as the Sunnis.